today is a big occasion and just like the last time you know we have something very interesting to discuss and as always you know uh, whenever it comes to cinema whenever it comes to discussing you know a legend of italian cinema with you you know it's something that i always you know look forward to and last time round we had the centenary celebrations of federico fellini and this time round we have you know none other than pier paolo pasolini it's his centenary year so italian culture center uh, here in delhi it has put together a wonderful retrospective uh, just like the fellini one again we are having a very unique set of films we have six feature length films and one short films and it's going to be a week long uh, affair starting with the second of november and i'll once again have the privilege of introducing all these films one after the other the first one of course you know we'll be discussing this in greater detail and i would love to have your perspective as well uh, is this short film uh, walls of sana and i think you know it will be a great discussion for us to you know touch upon that film but quickly i would also you know touch upon the different films in the retrospective just to set the ball rolling and then we can you know take one by one and would love to have your perspective on each one of these films because i think that would really open up an interesting conversation for anybody who comes for this uh, retrospective because fellini and pasolini you know these are very interesting figures and so that way you know it's going to be interesting so as i said we'll be starting with walls of sana uh, which is uh, you know on the second of november and on the second november itself because walls of sana is a short film we have our first feature film which is akatone uh, which was the first film that uh, pasolini directed it came out in 1961 and then from there on you know we'll be you know uh, having on a day to day basis one film and the next one on our lineup is uh, uccellaci uccellini and this will be followed by the gospel according to saint matthew which is again a very important film and it's been described by a vatican newspaper as probably the most important and probably the best film made on jesus christ and immediately after that you know uh, we are uh, you know taking certain very interesting departures uh we'll also you know move on to the trilogy of life which i feel is again uh, a very very different kind of a space uh, for anybody who wants to understand fellini uh he is not taking up interesting medieval literature pieces starting with the big cameron uh, uh beautiful you know way of cinematically representing it and then the next uh, thing on his uh, you know trilogy is uh, none other than uh, the canterbury tales by jeffrey chaucer and the he ends the trilogy with probably you know the most influential of all of these probably which is the arabian nights uh, 1001 nights we all have heard about it but the way pasolini treats it you know is what makes it very unique and it it makes this trilogy you know very very interesting in that sense because now pasolini is not just you know uh, interpreting these uh, masterworks of medieval literature but he is also you know commenting on the present day italy if we talk about the 70s so he's doing that so there are constant dialogues that are happening there so that's what makes you know and i'm i will you know of course uh, encourage you also you know to share your insights about uh, all these films uh, starting so, with the uh, you know akatone yeah well i believe a good way to begin this conversation and at the same time to pick up the thread of our uh, previous meeting on fellini Uh, well would be to define the difference between uh, the so called fellinesque and the pasolinesque uh, right because uh, these two directors have become so influential that their names are now being used as adjectival nouns no? so what is fellinesque well it is usually associated to a fascination for the surreal the bizarre uh, the circus um and is closely linked to a representation of reality that is often simple and flamboyant at the same time right uh, on the other end if we had to define the pasolinesque well we we would shift our focus uh, to the suburbs of the city uh, the lower strata of society and urban outcasts that that often uh you know um, play a role in a, in in a sensory realism of excesses that is deployed in uh, pasolini's films 
I mean, it was quite a controversial figure. No? I don't know how else to, to define them. No? And there are so many contradictions, Nico. You know, there is, you know, Marxist ideals. There is also Catholicism. You know, there is also, you know, the high culture. There is also the low culture. So how do you see that, all these contradictions, you know? Uh, well, I would say that, uh, you know, of course, Pasolini was a huge polemicist. No? And uh, something very peculiar about his methodology was that despite his upper middle class upbringing and his sense of belonging to a sort of intellectual elite of uh, his time, he had this visceral attraction for the suburban underworld. No? Something that mm. comes out uh, in, you know, his early uh, literary work. No? There are these two novels, uh, you know, strictly connected to the first movie we are discussing, no? mm. uh, Acatone. Mm. Acatone. Uh, Acatone, which was, is one of my favorite Pasolini's films. I don't know what, what was your uh, what was your first impression of these films when you when you watched it? See, I uh, was really surprised because you have to understand that my first Pasolini, you know, work in that sense was Knights of Kabiria because you know he collaborates with Fellini on that film. And when I watch Knights of Kabiria and I compare it to other Fellini films, it stands apart for me. And Later on, you know, when I realized that it's because of the fact because Pasolini collaborated on that. And, you know, now we are talking about the prostitutes, the pimps and the underbelly. I think that's what separates, uh, you know, a film like Knights of Kabiria from other Fellini films. Because that's, you know, Pasolini-esque in, in a sense, as you, you know, very beautifully touched in the very intro itself. And then if we connect that to Akatone, I think it becomes pretty clear, you know, that here is a beautiful, you know, a storyteller who wants to take us, you know, in a very different part of the society, which often gets overlooked, you know, and it is the underbelly, which is as real as any other world, probably the world that we see in films of Fellini or the world that we see, you know, in any other kind of cinema or the works of, you know, writers like Dostoevsky. This underbelly is a reality that cannot be overlooked. Well, uh, with neorealism, Pasolini shared uh, the, the setting and the location scouting uh, he carried out uh, in the Accatone, but the same we could say about his second film, Mamma Roma, with Anna Magnani, and even uh, the short film La Ricotta, uh, right? Though La Ricotta, you know, the short film, you know, it's not a part of the retrospective, but it's very interesting in how it completes this trilogy of sorts and also the fact that he collaborated with the legendary Orson Welles on the project. And even then, you know, it's very, very true to the first two films. It's about this filmmaker who wants to make this film on Jesus Christ. And yet the focus of the film is never really that. The focus of the film is that extra you know, who is supposed to play this character and ultimately he ends up dying. Such a, you know, beautiful way to connect it to the earlier two films. Well, and uh, it's quite ironic that uh, after uh, filming La Ricotta, which, which was basically a story depicting the shooting of a movie about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ filmed in the suburbs of Rome, with Orson Welles uh, playing the role of the director. Uh, well, uh, Pasolini himself ended up uh, filming a movie about the life of Jesus Christ, uh, which is the gospel according to St. Matthew. Uh, what did you think of it? Oh, I think, uh, you know, the connection is really great. And uh, if you remember, uh, uh, Pasolini actually received a lot of criticism for La Ricotta and probably somewhere the, you know, the image of Christ or, you know, somewhere it remained in his mind. And when he was invited by the Pope to represent uh, as a non, uh, you know, Catholic for that uh, conference, he was there and the whole day he spent in that hotel because there was Pope and it was all crowded. He couldn't go out on the streets. He spent the day reading all the four gospels. And it was then, then he decided that I want to make, uh, you know, the gospel according to St. Matthew, because it's that particular aspect 
that you know appeal to him the most and what's interesting is that he is a certified atheist and yet he is making a film on christ and when he does actually end up making the film on christ everybody praises it except for you know a very small section and the vatican newspaper has gone on you know much later to say that it's the best film on christ and so many critics in the world so many people in the world they have praised the film uh, a direct comparison of course is mel gibson's passion of christ but even there people say that what pasolini depicts in this film which came almost four decades before the mel gibson film is something that is very very true and i think for me the thing that's actually staggering is how less the dialogue is and he is whatever the dialogues that are used they taken straight away from the gospel and that's i think adds to the authenticity and probably uh, the choice of uh, actor that student from spain that is also an inspired one but i love it how he stages it how he decides not to he goes to the holy land to scout the locations he goes to jerusalem and he but he is very disappointed because of a lot of urbanization that has taken place that's when he decides to shoot it in parts of southern italy and i think that again was an inspired choice it really adds to the authenticity of the film the gospel according to some matthew is uh, uh, along with other movies of this transitional period in pasolini's career the closest film to uh, the cinema verite uh, perhaps for the use of you know a very playful uh, direct di- di- directing style uh, with a lot of zooms camera movements uh, um, editing uh, you know that defied the uh, classical principles of continuity uh, yeah so uh, it's quite enjoyable two years after the the gospel according to some matthew pasolini released ox and sparrows uh, called in italian uccellacci uccellini a film that uh, along with the gospel can be considered part of a transitional phase and a symptom also of where uh, pasolini was adding to with his films Uh, on the one hand, uh, this film shares uh, with neorealism as well as with his early films the similar setting in the suburbs on this area suspended between uh, the country and the city. Absolutely, and I like you know how he is using the uh, you know the parable of the sparrows and the crows, you know, or so to say, the hawks and the sparrows. uh beautifully you know i think he is also hinting at the class divide you know we are talking about if you look at the hawks you know they are the people who belong probably to the higher strata of the society and we talk about the sparrow probably the people who are you know coming from the humble background so i think that is also very interesting and how he uses a philosophical talking crow you know to add more elementary aspects of conversations to these two characters uh, toto and the other character um so i think that really uh, allows uh, pasolini to have this wonderful social commentary which you know which his films have always been known for so he is able to comment on the growing consumerism in the society he is also able to comment on the class divide and he is able to do it in a very new kind of a language that he is now discovering as he is slowly coming away from those new realistic origins and trying to you know find something which is new something which is more challenging more complex and also a little uh, daring in that sense so pasolini from the beginning of his career was motivated by what he called the la ricerca dell'altrove no the discovery of the elsewhere uh, something that he initially located in the suburbs of the city among urban outcasts Subsequently Pasolini would go on to expand the geographical scope of his quest. Um, it is interesting to note that Pasolini was very well aware of the debate about uh, the decolonization that was uh, becoming, you know, uh, heated and heated after uh, the liberation struggles of the previous decades. Uh, he was an avid reader of uh, authors like Franz Fanon. So, unlike many other filmmakers of uh, his times, Pasolini was also looking beyond the West and trying to open up his uh, work to different cultures. Uh, 
So, he, for example, he resorted to uh, locations in Syria, Turkey, and Morocco uh, to uh, restage the Greek tragedy uh, in films such as Oedipus Rex or Medea. Yeah, so it's quite interesting to, to evaluate uh, the, the, the degree of Pasolini's involvement in uh, countries that uh, at that time would be conventionally be termed as the part of the third world. We, we try to avoid this uh, definition nowadays. Uh, See, if you understand Pasolini, then you will realize that he was not very fond of this idea of this bipolar world, you know, the world divided into these two, you know, during the Cold War era, there is this American sphere, and then there is the Soviet sphere. So he was very inspired by Bandon, uh, the, con the conference that happened at Berlin in the 1950s, and how the African and the Indian countries and the rest of the world came together, and idea of non-alignment came out of it. So Pasolini was deeply inspired by this, and he wanted to stay away from these two blocks, and he wanted to explore, you know, what you know used to be called the third world, or probably the world which is free from these bipolar influences and that's what you know took him to africa and he made that film and then he also came to india and he made this film he actually wanted to make a full-fledged film uh, on india as he was greatly inspired by the indian philosophy the rich indian culture that india has always influenced uh, other world also and so that was something he wanted to make but unfortunately he couldn't complete his film but he did shoot you know parts of it, which included some interviews also. So uh, 30 odd minutes of footage. So that's what actually gave way to this film or sort of a documentary film called Notes for a Film in India. He always wanted to make a film in India, but he couldn't make it. But this actually served as a very great understanding of the artist that Pasolini was. And if you look at this film, then it's very different from a lot of the other work that the Western intellectuals have done on India. A lot of the Western intellectuals, when they come to India, they present India as this, you know, mystic land, the land of the jungle, the land of Mowgli, the land of snake charmers. But what Pasolini does is very different. He is actually empathizing, you know, a lot of the times and he's showing India in a very different light, in a light that no other probably Western intellectual, with the exception of Roberto Rosolini, who also came here in the 50s, did. So that's what separates, you know, Pasolini's understanding of this so-called world, which is free from the bipolar influences of the US and the Soviet back in the 70s. So that's what makes it very, very interesting, in my opinion. And all it all, you know, takes something from that spirit of Bandon, you know, which started it all. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, the film you mentioned on India uh, was supposed to be part of a never, never realized uh, third world filmic poem, you know, in which Pasolini would have included uh, segments uh, set in various parts of the world. India, of course, but also the Arab countries, Africa, South Americas, and the black ghettos of the United States, uh, all of which Pasolini would, would have wanted to unify it. Uh, in a global revolution from below. I think that's what separates Pasolini from a lot of, you know, other contemporaries of his. He was truly always striving for this universal spirit. He was always looking at the world from this lens, which was completely devoid of, you know, these small sort of a regional aspect. He was always coming with a universal view, a view, you know, which very few intellectuals of his time. In fact, even if you look at today, there are not many intellectuals who speak, even though we now call the whole, you know, universe of the earth as a global village. But I think that sense of universality that reflects in some of the works of Pasolini, that is something that's still very unique. Uh, if we just take the case of these three films, you know, of the trilogy, starting with Decameron, the Canterbury Tales, the Arabian Nights, I think the kind of choices that he makes, whether it's the location choices, whether what he uh, chooses with the language, whether the kind of sets that he chooses, or whether the camera choices, the lens choices that he makes, I think that is very, very striking in the personality what Pasolini was. He was truly a humanist. He was truly somebody who saw this world in a very universal sort of a mindset and not, you know, as thing which is isolated from one and the other. 
I think that are the uh, factors that makes the strategy very unique. Of course, he's also critiquing, you know, the uh, consumerism existing at that point in time in Italy. He's also critiquing the bourgeois. He's also, you know, going about his social political commentary. But at the same time, he's also presenting a very optimistic and a very universal view of the world. And the beautiful score that Ennio Morricone gives in these films, I think that is also something that really elevates, you know, the mystic quality or so to say uh, the medieval, uh, you know, the literary aspects of this actually comes out to the fore through the use of music. And I think uh, Pasolini and uh, Morikwani, they are able to weave this beautiful magic in which the images and the uh, music, there's a certain harmony, heart and symphony in there, which is very rare in films, even, you know, from the era that Pasolini lived. And nowadays, you know, it's becoming less and less rare anyway. These movies, uh, they show, uh, I would say, a less pessimistic the vision of the world, no? Uh, Pasolini himself has uh, stated in interviews that, you know, these are the film of a man made by a man who had aged somehow and so looked and at, uh, at the world in a different way. No? I would say that if there is a common thread to this movie is uh, the, the, the trick sex, you know, that becomes somehow a weapon of uh, you know the people to blur uh, inequalities in terms of class, uh, race, gender. Uh, it's uh, you know the the heroes of these movies are you know uh, boundary breaking characters, you know tricksters that uh, um, that move across uh, different geography. And this movie somehow are set. Uh, uh, you know, in the uh, in in a medieval world, uh, which we would say, I could say, for Pasolini represented the start of a modern order of things. You know, in the movements of travelers, merchants, royals, uh, migrants, uh, it, it's a very uh, anti-hierarchical world. You know, it's a it's a global world that is coming up, you know? and they are indeed, we would say. The most entertaining films made by uh, by Pasolini, you know, because that epicness visible in movies like Medea and uh, Oedipus Rex, you know, inspired by the Greek tragedy, that epicness here is gone, you know, and uh, take the back seats. Whereas, you know, a sort of uh, lightness, you know, um, permeates the, the the film here, right? So. Yeah, and this, this somehow reminds us classic. more of Uccellini Uccellacci, you know, than yes. things yes. in between. Yes. Slapstick comedy at its best. So yeah, uh, we are coming to an end, basically. Uh, and, uh, you know, the first movie, as you said, that will be uh, screened in this retrospective is a movie, The, the Walls of Sana, uh, which was shot uh, precisely around the time Pasolini was working on his uh, trilogy of life. No? What's amazing is that it's not really a movie, it's actually a petition and it's a petition to UNESCO to preserve, you know, the beauty of, you know, Sana, which was and is, is uh, still the capital of Yemen. And it was a medieval city and a city which is so old that it has been constantly inhibited from the, you know, earliest times that humanity knew. So this city was undergoing a lot of modernization. It's, it's something that has been happening in a lot of cities of the world. And in this particular film, Pasolini compares to a lot of these developments which take place in Italy, and he compares to what was now happening in Yemen. And he makes this film as this petition to UNESCO so that UNESCO could make it you know, a site which is preserved, which is protected. And this film is all about that. He's trying to, you know, empower the people of Yemen whose voice may not be heard by the authorities out there. So it's a petition. Unfortunately, Pasolini didn't live long enough to see that the petition was actually realized. And in 1986, the film, uh, which, you know, the request of the film, which was to make the city of Sana a UNESCO site was finally, you know, fulfilled. And it actually became a UNESCO site in 1986. But this film, you know, uh, 
started it all. So I think this is very unique in Pasolini's filmography in that it's not just a film, it's also an appeal, it's also a petition. And it also reflects the kind of influence that an artist like Pasolini enjoyed or an intellectual like Pasolini enjoyed. And it was not just limited to cinema. He was also doing things which transcended the boundaries of art and he was actually trying to, you know, preserve this city for the posterity and for the people of Yemen, whose voices may not have been heard by the authorities otherwise. Uh, as you rightly said, uh, this was not a film uh, in the conventional connotation of the term. It was never intended uh, for a theatrical release. It was in fact shipped by Pasolini to the UNESCO headquarters in Rome, where a copy was kept and uh, rediscovered uh, years after, very interestingly. And uh, I believe, you know, it's a, a wise choice to open the retrospective with this film because uh, it, uh, of course, it, it not only uh, sparked uh, a debate around the, the, the protection of the cultural heritage around the world uh, many years ago, uh, and also in, it somehow encapsulates all uh, Pasolini's critiques of the aberration uh, that uh, capitalism was bringing to the fore. So as always, Nico, uh, you know, it was absolutely wonderful to discuss, uh, you know, a great Italian figure with you. Last time around, it was Pasolini. Last time around it was Fellini and this time, you know, we had a wonderful discussion on Pasolini and I would like to encourage each one of you who are watching this discussion to come out, you know, uh, for this retrospective because it's a very unique retrospective that we have put together. Not just the fact that it's the centenary, but this kind of retrospective hasn't actually happened. This kind of selection that we are bringing for you of Pasolini films is very, very rare. And these are the films that we have had to go to great lengths to find because some of these films were not even available with English subtitles. So we had to source it from the US, from other parts of the world. That's what makes it retrospective very unique. And uh, thanks to you, Nico, I think we are able to start a beautiful conversation around the figure of Pasolini, around these six, seven films that we have in the retrospective. And I'm sure a lot of people will only, you know, become more curious about Pasolini and they'll come, you know, in great numbers to watch these films that we have for them uh, in the first week of November. And uh, uh, I really uh, must thank you for making this so engaging and so uh, enlightening for all of us in that sense that a figure like Pesolini, who is very complex and who is very multifaceted, multidimensional, who is constantly evolving. But I think through this discussion, we have actually started a very interesting discourse, you know, which can further open up for a lot of other people to contribute to this wonderful figure called Pasolini. Whenever you enter Pasolini's words, it's very, different, very difficult to get out, you know, because it's so fascinating and so many are the angles from which we can approach, interpret and enter his uh, artistic and cultural production, whether we are talking about his journalism, uh, his literary criticism, uh, his novels or poems, uh, of course, his uh, cinema, uh, yeah, it's 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 incredible, uh, and uh, it's a world rich of cultural references and uh, in dialogue with, uh, you know, the, the the intellectual history of the 20th century.